My name is Tony Sirdum. I was born in Pomona in 1937, and I lived here all my life. I was born in the same house that my mother was born in. When my mother was born, just before I was, but she's about a little bit older than me, and. My father was born down the street too. He was my, my, my father was born in Chino, and so we've lived here all our lives. Uh, Pomona and Chino are two towns that are pretty close together, and I'm very proud of my my family's history because. My great grandfather, his name was Jesus Villa, who was the first settler in this whole valley when this wasn't the United States yet. It was still Mexico when he came here. And so our family had been here for a long time. My name is Joshua Swodek. Uh, Diné, Pueblo, um, some other colonizer stuff mixed in. Um, uh, was called Little White Cloud uh, as a kid because they brought the snow. Um, 50 years old, uh, married to a beautiful African American, uh, French Creole, Choctaw, uh, Blackfoot woman. Um, have two. Afro-Indigenous kids with a whole bunch of other stuff in them who are, love art, um, living in uh, my beloved community, Pomona. Hello, greetings. I'm from the villages Isakanga and Shivagna, which is present-day Montebello, South San Gabriel area. Tribal name is Strong Standing Oak, and I'm happy to be here with you all. So my name is Joshua Andujo. I'm a member of the Gabrielino Tongva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians under the leadership of Chief Anthony Rebba Morales. In the village of Toibinga, also known as Pomona, there is a powerful presence of indigenous people, the Gabrielino Tongva people. Their existence to this day has been silenced, mistold, co-opted, or gatekept by many social institutions. Gabrielino Tongva people take pride in being the first people to connect to the land. Well, our connection to us was was very good because you know we were always from here, and I always knew that we were here and we were the first settlers in this area. My great grandfather came here, and this was still Mexico at the time, and he really liked this place because the weather here is very good. Uh, and you notice right now how good the weather is. Well, the weather is always good here. Very seldom do we have bad weather. Many refer to the history of Pomona to be the citrus groves, the fair plex, the adobe house, but the history of the land extends far into the past. Um, there's really rich history in Pomona. Um, I will say, unfortunately, most of it doesn't get told. There's a lot of misinformation out there. So just because you read something doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but start with that and then continue to dig. Social institutions have co-opted and extracted the history of the Gabrielino Tong people as teaching tools, using sacred artifacts to create knowledge production. But for what end? Who is benefiting from this learning? That too, and also learning from non-native people because, you know, since we don't have access to a lot of the archives and things like that we have to build relationships with people and it's sad because that's our culture and they're gatekeeping it from us same thing with the artifacts a lot of it goes to either universities museums and a good percentage of it is also in private collectors collections so like we're never going to be able to learn about a lot of the missing history they're coming across a lot of these archaeological sites and to study our past you know they want information but for us all that stuff was left there with intention. We weren't there to expect others to dig it up because that's how we respected our culture. I think a lot of 
the broader indigenous community is now just learning about their heritage um, because it was something that got um, erased uh, sometimes by colonization, but honestly, sometimes by survival, uh, which is still related to colonization because you felt like you had to survive that. But really understanding like, what were the, the beliefs of like these people? Um, what made them special? And what parts did we get rid of through colonization? And what parts uh, have we lost? And what parts can we bring back? So my community's history, uh, we've been here for thousands of years since time immemorial. Um, I want to welcome you all to the village of Foibingna, which is now present day Mon uh, Pomona. And again, we've been here for thousands of years. And I think it's important that people acknowledge our history because, you know, not only do we outdate all the people that came after us, but we also contributed to a lot of modern day society history as well. I wanna say the beginning of the year, maybe last year, we got a park changed from Kalia Park to Horina Park, which is actually the village of Mount Baldy. And Claremont was a Toro Horina, which meant the place under the snowy mountain. And the reason why they like to talk about the Kui is because some anthropologists and people that were doing the research, they found a lot of Oyas that came from the Kuia territory. And that was only because of trade. Just because you find some of our artifacts in different states or different parts of the world doesn't mean that that's our claim to that area. So just because we traded with the Kauia, they like to say, well, this is also Kauia territory. And if anything, they should be acknowledging the Serranos because the Serranos were our neighbors. So I feel like they should be advocating for them as well. Um, but yeah, so I feel like Claremont, Parts of Pomona can do a better job in doing more research on that. I think it's important that we tell our history and our side of the story. And one thing I like to share is a story that my chief always tells when we do presentations is when our people were being brought into the mission, everyone was wondering what's going to happen to the culture. Where are we going to hide it? Are we going to hide it in the ocean? Are we going to hide it in the mountains? And this old fragile elder was in the back shaking her hand and she said, Chief, I know where we can hide it. And the chief called on to her and said, where? And she said, the children, they're the future. And you know, that is true because when we teach, well, what we learn from our elders, we share it on to our children and then they pass it on to their children. So that's how we're gonna keep it alive. And hopefully they become the future educators. Some people hold that to their heart saying, oh no, you don't know what you're talking about. Or you're, you need to under, like, do better research and things like that. So we do get pushback from professors or historians and things like that. But like I said, when you study the land, you're gonna start, our side of the story is gonna start telling its part. And that's why when people were saying that we've been here for 5,000 years or 8,000 years, now with a lot of the archives and the information that's becoming, it shows that we've been here longer. So we're also learning from the land. It is believed by many that a land acknowledgement fulfills reconciliation by recognizing the presence of indigenous people. However, this act is nothing more than performative as institutions and other organizations attempt to fulfill their ethical duty of mentioning the indigenous territory they occupy. I feel like with the land acknowledgements, people think it's just like check on the box and they've done their part, but there's a lot more that needs to come after a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is merely scratching the surface to learn about indigenous people. It should not be the substitution for honoring the resilience, perseverance, and justice for all the people that came before us. Yet, too often, the stories are acclaimed as artifacts or the lived experiences of indigenous people are taken and kept away under the guise of academic preservation or visual exhibition as if the people to whom it belongs to are no longer present. So I feel like Pitzer College can do a better job in sharing that information with us. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of people learn our culture and like to gatekeep that stuff. And it's, that's our culture. We have every right to learn about our family in the past. These institutions, they get a lot of money, a lot of funding. So for them to invite people from out of state or different parts of the country to come and share their culture, I feel like they should put that time and energy into the people whose land they're occupying and be able to share our culture with them as well. Oh, you know what? The trees are important because a lot of people don't think about that. But the trees, they're our most 
our most oldest relatives that we have, and we're all related together. If they could only talk, they would be able to say so much, but they don't, don't talk. So we got to remind, remind ourselves to be able to talk for them and to take care of them. And there's a lot of ones that aren't from here, and, and, and that's okay. But the original trees from here, uh, they should be protected. And, and uh, I, I fought a lot. There's, you, you can go some places and you still find trees that they build around them that I help protect. Because to me, it was important to take care of those trees. Those trees were here long before the city was here. But, and they were trying to take them down and put the streets. And I said, nah, go around them. You got to respect those trees. They can't speak for themselves, but as long as I'm alive, I'll fight for them. And, and that just, that's what I, that's what I feel that way. Uh, I really enjoy the trees, especially the original trees. And, and, and I, it's, it, it's so good. And, and, feels so good to see those big trees growing and, and, and the trees that were here. For years and years, even before I was born, and they're still here. So I, I hope you remember to have people protect those trees because uh, they're a very important part of our lives. I think for me, I feel it's like honoring the indigenous people who are still with us. Not like that was a long time ago or something, but understanding that their ancestors are part of. Now, maybe you've only been, you know, on Turtle Island for, you know, a generation or two or whatever. That's fine too, because you can come and honor the, the ancestors. Maybe they're not your ancestors, but you can honor the ancestors that exist here. How do we listen to and learn new truths? What is our duty as occupiers of this land? And we asked ourselves, what is our role as part of the reparations for indigenous people? I think that the main thing to do is to understand the indigenous people and understand what is a be makes this a better place for us to live in and to share together. And, and, and to me, uh, as long as we can create a good environment, which I know that when you have the, the people's ear, you have a good chance to get people to recognize that. Now for a long time, they've always tried to put us together, put us against each other rather than working together because when we're together, we could accomplish so much more and get things done. But with the division, it's just holding us back, I would say. Despite our differences, we're all Gabrielino. We all have ancestry that comes from this land, so we should all be acknowledged and worked with. I love the idea of people sharing stories and like getting past sort of the labels and all the things and realizing like, hey, we each have our own individual story. And so while maybe you don't understand my last name, which is weird, um, I'm sorry, Dad. Um, but the other side is, is like my unique story may connect in the story and the struggles and the challenges you've had in your lives. Look at the trees. I remember when they were little, and look how big the trees are now, those palm trees. I remember they were little tiny trees. And it feels so good to see them grow so big and strong. You know, just like that community.